We continue in our study of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the sermon letter written by, we don't know the author, written to not a specific people that we've been able to identify, but we know that they are Jewish Christians. They are Jewish Christians who have come under persecution, and some of them are thinking about turning back and going to their former practice of faith, letting go of their profession in Jesus and returning to the sacrificial system, the feasts, the festivals, all that had made the Israelite culture enjoyable to them, they start to get a little homesick for it. And the author of Hebrews writes this written word, this written exhortation, saying, do not let go of your profession in Jesus. Jesus, you must fix your eyes on Him. You must hold fast to Him. Hold tightly to Him. Do not let go when persecution comes or when boredom comes into your life. Hold fast to your good confession. This morning, things are going to take a turn, and actually for the next several chapters in Hebrews, it will sound like I'm repeating myself, because he is repeating himself. Brace yourself for themes of the priesthood, and when we talk about the priesthood, we talk about bloodshed. Blood, 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 blood. Here it comes in his sermon and therefore in this sermon. Give your attention to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's pray that God would bless our understanding of his word. Lord, would you now use your word in our hearts and in our minds to do that priestly work of cutting us and rearranging us for our good and for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, I've been known to be a sucker for a good infomercial. Some of my friends make fun of me because I just fall for the trap. And uh, there's evidence of that all in our kitchen and closet and in my barn. <laughs> Sliding furniture pads and folding coat hangers. I've got them. Space bags, the storage of the future. You betcha. <laughs> Copper frying pan. Well, why not? The incredible space-saving, shrinking garden hose. I have two of them. <laughs> and then the creme de la creme, the miracle blade. And the miracle blade, too. Absolutely have those. 
why the miracle blade can cut through shoe leather after being beaten with a hammer, you'd be crazy to not try to own that, right? So I'm a sucker for these things, especially when you can get two for the price of one if you order in the next 24 hours. So this morning, our attention in Scripture is turned towards what we could call the miracle blade, the sword of the Lord. And at the end of this, um, I, I would love it if, it if it was just too good to be true for you, that you had to know this sword and have this sword do its work in you and on you because it truly is, as we'll see in the passage, it is what we need. It's what we must have, and it is how God ordinarily works. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 began through the gates boldly, you may recall if you were here, with a doctrine of Scripture and with a doctrine of Revelation and with a doctrine of who Jesus Christ is. This is really doctrine of Scripture part 2 now at the beginning of chapter 4. We're going to hear a lot about Scripture, God's Word, and how He works. And I have three simple points, and they are simply this. The first point is this. It's the sword of the Lord. Verse 12 of Hebrews 4. Listen to that again. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And so the imagery here is of a cutting instrument. Can we say that? The word uh, in our English translation is sword. It certainly is a sword, but it's not just a sword. Sometimes when we read this passage, if we're familiar with Ephesians chapter 6 and how the Apostle Paul describes the Roman soldier and spiritual warfare and he talks about the Word of God is the sword, we read Hebrews 4, we immediately picture that, that Roman centurion, that Roman guard holding a sword like that. I don't think that's the imagery. I think that's probably the wrong imagery, actually. And you'll see why as we get into the passage. It is a sharp, cutting instrument. And the Bible's filled with stories about sharp, cutting instruments. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament, as you know, perhaps you know, is filled with stories of sharp, cutting instruments that were used in the life of God's people, whether on newborn sons or whether in priestly sacrifices. Sharp cutting instruments have always had a part of God's relationship with his people. And I think more than picturing the soldier with a sword, the imagery we have here in Hebrews chapter 4 and the next five chapters that flow from this verse, I don't want you to picture a soldier. I want you to picture a priest. A priest with a priestly knife that is like a double-edged sword. Sharp, capable, and cutting in the service of the Lord and His people in offering sacrifices. The author is about to pick up on multiple chapters of constant language and themes about the priesthood. Even the second section of our text this morning, he immediately talks about Jesus as the great high priest. And so this morning, as we talk about this subject, I want you in your own mind to picture the priest with his sharp cutting instrument. An instrument so sharp that it was precise to be able to cut what would have thought to be uncuttable distinguishing soul from spirit or the cutting of joints. And that's where the language of the priesthood really is most vivid because that is what the priest did. He cut the joints. Now, <clears throat> we have different hobbies. Some of you may know that my hobbies include cooking meat and watching videos about how to cook meat and recipes about how to cook meat. 
Well, in the last few, me, uh, last few months, I found something related to all that that's of interest to me. And it's called, they are called the Butcher Brothers. And if you haven't seen them on YouTube, these are just two, I guess they're brothers from Ohio who are butchers. And they've got big beards because everybody has big beards in the last few years. But they, they will show you how to use a butcher knife and how with precision to cut up an animal. Now, what kind of person watches those videos on YouTube? That's just bizarre, isn't it? Well, it's just fascinating uh, to me. And I thought of some of those images and things that I've seen as, as I'm reading this and picturing the Old Testament priest with his priestly knife in hand. Now, we don't have that image easily in our mind. It might be easier for you to picture your butcher at Publix or Food Lion or wherever you go. That he is dressed in garments to be able to get bloody. And he brandishes a sharp cutting instrument. That's the imagery that we see. That's the instrument that we see as we get into this. And the reason he tells us this, he says, is because of point number two. I'm going to call it because of the eye in the sky. And that's not the language used in this passage, but it's, it's our understanding of, of what he's saying. Listen again to verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. He has told us about a cutting instrument, and now he is warning against what we could call a cutting judgment, a discerning judgment from an all-seeing God from whom nothing can be hidden, which means he knows the thoughts and inclinations of our hearts and our minds. And that is alarming. That is concerning for every one of us who breathes. If you're a breathing person, you should be concerned that there is a holy God who discerns with cutting judgment the inclinations of your heart, the intentions of your heart, and who has a standard of holiness and righteousness that he measures those with. Every one of us who breathes, we have reason to be alarmed. In the youth group on Sunday nights, we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount. And I actually preached on that here a year or so ago. But you remember, Jesus has this language talking to his disciples, saying things like, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, anyone who hates his brother is guilty of murder. Jesus ratchets up our understanding of righteousness. Where we might think, well, I've never murdered someone. Jesus identifies that we are all murderers. Tonight, we're going to do that difficult passage right after that one where Jesus says, you've heard that it was said not to commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who has lust in his heart is an adulterer. So pray for me tonight as I speak to our youth about that. But the point is the same. Jesus is ratcheting up the standard of righteousness. And there is a judgment that is coming for the people that God has created. It is a cutting judgment. There is an all-seeing God from which no one can hide anything. And the language there in the NIV that I read says everything is laid Bear. But literally, it's everything is opened up. It's laid bare in the sense that it's opened up. Now, this is where I want you to have that image of the priest with his cutting instrument. One of the videos that I've watched in trying to understand how to cut and cook meat, which is the point of cutting, is that you could cook it, right? But it's, uh, it's how to cook chicken and turkeys, of all things. Some of you maybe are familiar with spatchcock cooking. Spatchcock method. Anybody done that for Thanksgiving or with chicken? Let me tell you what the spatchcock method is. 
It's quite simply when you slice the bird and force him into two halves. The bird is dead, right? <laughs> you put the, the halved bird. Now, this is important. There's some theology going on here. You put the halved bird on the grill so that it cooks thoroughly and evenly. If you put the whole turkey on the grill or the whole chicken on the grill, some of it will burn while other parts of it remain raw. And so the spatchcock method is literally a discerning, slicing division, an opening up of the bird, a laying of it bare so that it can be thoroughly cooked and transformed into something delicious. That's the imagery here. Everything is opened up. Now we read this, and if you're not thinking of the priesthood, you're going to fill in the blank with your own imagery and your own things. But he is talking about the priesthood. These very next verses, starting in verse 14, running for the next, I think it's five chapters, are all about the priesthood of Jesus. And what he is saying here is that the Word of God, it's not dead it's not old news. It's living. It's active. It's discerning. It's cutting of the heart. And what he's saying is God uses his word to cut his people. And what did the priests do when he would cut the animals? Well, they didn't spatchcock the birds. What they did was they would take the bulls and the goats, and the priest had the responsibility with that knife to literally dismember the animal, to cut the joints off and to separate those, and here it is, literally, to rearrange the animal. To rearrange the animal. Now you need to understand that is the language that he's using about God and his people and his word. That God cuts his people and rearranges them to make them a sacrifice that can one day ascend up into his presence and be received. This is a doctrine of Scripture. This is a doctrine of how God works in the lives of his people through his word when it's read, when it's preached, when it's heard in any way, when it's sung. It's a doctrine of Scripture. Peter Lightheart says in his commentary on this passage, he says this, The word for cut in Hebrew means dismember. And the fact that the animal was cut into his pieces implies that he was divided into his constituent parts. The idea is not so much that of chopping a bull or a sheep into stew meat. The idea is more cutting the legs from the hips, the tail from the spine. It is our being cut up by the word of God to ascend to God, to be translated into His kingdom, to become new, glorified creations. Sinners must first be dismembered by the Word. That may be a radical new thought for you. But some of you could come up and take the microphone and share your testimony about how years ago the Lord dismembered you, He rearranged you, He changed you, your interests, your passions, your pursuits. That's the kind of cutting that I'm talking about, that the Scriptures are talking about. So consider just these few stories of conviction and conversion that have come from this cutting Word of God in the lives of some people who maybe you know. I don't know if you know the story of Charles Spurgeon. But his conversion story is one of leaving on a snowy morning to walk to church by himself. And the snow was so intense, he didn't get to go to his own church. He had to duck into another church, a church that he wasn't familiar with. And he popped in and he sat in the back of the church. And it wasn't even a preacher that day who was leading up front. It was a lay elder who simply read in boring fashion a faithful scripture, a faithful sermon on Holy Scripture. And Charles Spurgeon would say, it had never happened to me before. 
But the word of God put its finger on me through that man who was not even gifted to be leading up front, he says. And conviction came upon me. I knew that I was a sinner who was miserably lost and who needed a Savior. That's the cutting instrument of the Word of God in the hand of Jesus, our great priest. That's how he works. Or maybe you know the story of John Newton. John Newton, who lost his mother at a very young age, but she is a faithful Christian, had him memorize Scripture had him familiar with the gospel story. And though he would live a wayward life for many years, in his young adulthood, he would come to his senses. And you know what he says in his biography, in his autobiography? It was the Word of God and the Scriptures that my mother taught me that essentially haunted me. They never left me alone. And when I needed to know them, they were there. That's that cutting instrument of God using His Word by His Spirit in the lives of His people. One more story, maybe less familiar to you. It's the story of Ebenezer Erskine, one of the two brothers that Erskine College is named after. A minister in Scotland. He was a minister, and he looked back on his life as if he was unconverted. He said his heart was cold. It was like a stone. He had theological knowledge, but his his heart was cold. But his sweet wife had a tender faith in Christ. He would hear his wife talking about her faith to someone else, to one of her friends. And deep inside, he started to feel convicted that I, I don't have that kind of faith. My wife has a more sincere faith than I do. Then she fell very ill and almost died. And in her sickness, her prayers, her fervency moved him. And he was converted, he says, after being a Christian minister, by the fervent prayers and modeling of faith by his wife. And his life would change. Uh, If you have a handout, I included this for you on there. He... he, uh, He wrote a covenant, a personal covenant, in response to that experience with his wife. This is what he wrote on the day of his conversion. He says, I offer myself up. Sounds like a sacrifice, doesn't it? I offer myself up, soul and body, unto God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I flee for shelter to the blood of Jesus. I will live to him. I will die to him. I take heaven and earth to witness that all I am and all I have are his. That's a beautiful little personal covenant, isn't it? A testimony of conversion. And so God has always worked through this cutting instrument of his word in the hands of his spirit, in the hands of his son, working upon the affections, the emotions, the heart, the minds of his people. And they're changed by what he does. They're completely changed by what he does. This is what Spurgeon said of his own conversion, or excuse me, of the Scriptures. He says, The Bible can impart life to its readers. When our soul is faint and ready to die, a single word of it applied to the heart by the Spirit of God can arouse us For it is the living, quickening Word of God. Have you found that to be your experience? Has the Bible ever aroused you? Has it ever breathed life into your weary bones, into your tired heart? That's the cutting instrument that God says He uses. Spurgeon also said of the Scriptures this. Perhaps you can resonate with this. The Bible is a book that has wrestled with me. It is a book that has smitten me. It has comforted me, smiled on me, and it has frowned upon me. The book has grasped my hand and warmed my heart. The book weeps with me, sings with me, whispers to me, and preaches to me. It maps my way and holds me up. 
It is a living book from its first chapter to its last word and is full of strange, mystic vitality which makes it have preeminence over every other writing for every child of God. Have you found the scriptures to handle you in that way? It's the cutting instrument of God that works upon the sinful heart of men and women and children on this earth. I think of my own experience personally, not comparing myself to Spurgeon, Newton, Wesley, or anybody, but I was 15 years old, and I had grown up in a Christian family. I'd been baptized as a little child. I'd been taken to church all my life, Sunday school for some of that. I was 15 years old and going with a youth group to uh, assembly grounds called Bon Clarken, kind of like your Ridge Haven. And I remember hearing two speakers that weekend, the theme of which being preaching from John 4, John 3, you must be born again. You must be born again. And I heard that theme over and over again. And as a 15-year-old boy, I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. How can you know if you've been born again? And the little introverted, quiet, 15-year-old Paul Patrick said, I've got to know if that question's answered. It is the ultimate question. So I went to the speaker during free time and said, can I have a minute with you? I want to talk about this being born again. The Spirit of God, through the preaching of the Word, stirs people. It cuts people. It brings a sense of urgency of, I've got to know what's true, and I've got to act upon it. Now, that's why in, in this church, you will hear us, you've already heard us routinely say things like, if you'd like to join the church, if you're not a member of the church, if you're ready to come to a communicants class, if you've, if you've never professed your faith in Christ before and would like to do so with our elders, it's so that you can know, that you can know that you've responded by faith to what God has said is true. And so you must be born again. And that word from Scripture, it stirred me, it cut me, and my life has been changed with an assurance of what God has done for His people ever since. And so I'm thankful for that. So what would your story be? How would you tell your story of how God's Word has cut into your heart, dismembered you, rearranged you, and begun to make a new creature out of you? Do you have a testimony like that? Or does all this sound like how God works in other people's lives? I would say brace yourself as we continue in the book of Hebrews as he tries to bring these words of assurance and confidence that these people would not let go of the one hope that they have, but that they would hold fast to that profession of faith and to know that the gospel is true for them. One more quote from Spurgeon. Actually, I have two more. He says this. Listen to what he says about the word and its power to convert us. He says, the Word of God is powerful for conversion. It comes on board a man like a ship. It comes on board a man. And without asking for permission from him, it puts its hands on the helm and turns him around in the opposite direction from that which he was going. And yet that man gladly yields to the irresistible power which transforms his understanding and his will. Do you have a story that sounds anything like that? I was doing this. I was going to be this. The Lord redirected my heart, my passions, my interests, and I am just fine with it. That's how we would say the same thing as Spurgeon in our own language. Thirdly and lastly... The bloody sacrifice of our great high priest. Listen again to verses 14 through 16. And you see him link that imagery of the sword to the priesthood with that word, therefore. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, 
yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's, God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Briefly on this, we know from our Old Testament and our New Testament that a bloody sacrifice is required of sinners. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, our reflection reading from this morning. Apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Bloody sacrifice is required of sinners. But the gospel beauty, the message of what Jesus has done for his people is what we must hear next. And that is that a bloody sacrifice has been provided for us. What is required of us, God in Christ has provided for us. And judgment is certain. We know that. For the wages of sin is death, we're told in the scriptures. We're told that all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so the story of the Bible, if you're new to the Bible, a little summary of the big picture of the Bible is that if you sin, you die. Blood must be shed. Something must die to account for sin. And you and I would be accountable to bleed for our own sins, and we would die. But the mystery of the gospel, and here's your imagery once again, is that our great high priest, who is Jesus, who brandishes that cutting instrument, has offered himself as the sacrifice for his people. That his blood, which is eternal, covers them. It was shed for them. And so though blood is required of us, he has provided the bloodshed that is necessary. That's why in one of the hymns that we sing, we didn't sing it today, but arise, my soul arise, shake off your guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice on my behalf appears. That's the story of the gospel. Blood must be shed. The priesthood was all about shedding blood, the cutting instrument of God used to sacrifice an animal. And here the Lord Jesus is the great high priest. And he has offered himself as the sacrifice for sinners. Our great high priest who is sympathetic to us, but who is a sinless savior, the passage says he passed through the heavens. He cut through the heavens. It's a third imagery of cutting that's going on here in the text. There's a cutting instrument. God uses it to cut the hearts of his people. And what could not be approached by us because of God's holiness, Jesus penetrates. He passes through. He cuts through the clouds. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from whence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. So this morning, as all this comes together, the closing word that he has in verse 16 is that because all of that is true, if you believe it by faith, all of that applies to you in such a way that you can approach him with a bold confidence that he has paid the price and enabled you by faith to have access to him, the one true living God. And so though the thought of judgment would make us tremble, we know by faith we have a blood covering, perfect blood from a perfect Savior, and that mysteriously this great high priest, he sacrificed himself for us. Now remember who these people are. They've been thinking about going back. We won't go back to our old ways. We won't go back to sacrifices, feasts, festivals. Do you see what he's doing as an author? He's saying, you, you can't give this up. Those sacrifices mean nothing. There is but one sacrifice that matters. How could you just turn and walk away from this? He says to them, and he says to us.
Let's pray that we might have faith to hold fast to this gospel truth. Lord, that is our prayer. And would you use your word to cut us and to rearrange us that we might be living sacrifices for you. Lord, as Spurgeon said, oh, to be sacrificed unto God and his word to be the sacrificial knife, that his word could be put to the throat of every sinful tendency of ours, every sinful habit, every sinful thought. There is no sin killer like the word of God, and it always comes to bring death to evil. Lord, would you do that in us, even this week, as we think about your word and read your word. Have your way with us, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.